depends who. Why grace? This is not something that Jews usually ask about. So wh where did the topic come from? Uh, uh, Are you asking for, I guess I, I would have yeah, to say that, me to answer yeah. that probably. Since. Was it, you, you picked the topic? <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Now we know where <laughs> so, the topic came from. So, yeah. you, why, so why did you pick the topic? Um, seems, you know, I think any of the work we've been trying to do at North Shore Congregation Israel well, really any point in time, but in particular, since uh, over this last now eight month, eight month period, if not really over this last um, four year period has really been about attempting to address um, what is really needed in our communities, our societies um, in order to um, reweave uh, the web of connection, which, um, feels or is torn. Um, I can't, I would say it is torn, but some people tell me maybe it, I just perceive it that way. Either way though, it did seem like um, grace uh, is, is something at the heart of, is the heart of any uh, process that might involve coming back together. And it's something from a Jewish lens that I think um, the Jewish community, by and large, would attribute outside of itself to the Christian community, I think, because yeah, Christians have done such a better job about marketing grace than Jews have. But they got it from us, as far as I know. I'm sure we got it from somebody else. But the, you know, the, this grace is, is a concept that's, that's so critical, at least in my mind. So um, we were excited that given knowing your, your extensive writing about it, that you might be able to bring it to us in a powerful way. Well, well, we'll see. We'll see what happens about that. <laughs> I mean, I was surprised, just to give you a little background. So yeah, I wrote this book called Amazing Chesed, uh, which said that the subtitle is Living a Grace-Filled Judaism. I wrote it under duress. Um, it was the public, 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 the public. What he wanted was, this is Jewish Lights, what he wanted was a book called Amazing Chesed, and he didn't know what that was other than the, what he thought was a great time, and asked me if I would write the book. So first I said, well, Chesed doesn't mean grace. It's really Chain is grace. It's a different word, but Amazing Chain just didn't work in the, in his, to his ear as far as publishing goes. So we argued about it, and I said, well, I don't, I don't know what I can say about it that that's of any value. And, and his says, we need a book on grace because Christians, I guess sort of the way Rabbi said, Christians have cornered the market on, on the word. And I want to have this word and I want to call the book Amazing Grace. And if you don't write it, you're going to find that you're not writing anything else for us either. And there was something I had in the pipeline. He said, if you want to do this book on writing with your son, you have to first do this book on grace. So... I said, well, I guess I'll write a book on grace. Then when I finished the book, I sent it to him and he wrote back and he said, this is not the book I'm looking for, but it's a very important book. So I'm gonna publish it anyway. So I don't know if he was tired of fighting with me or there's actually something to the book, but I'm gonna give you the heart of it over the next few minutes. And um, Rabbi and I were talking about how best to do this last time the idea was for me to present everything and then open it up to Q&A. This time we're gonna to try to make it a little less formal and you can jump in whenever you want. I may stop periodically and ask for your comments uh, so you don't have to hold them till the very end. So when I was looking to figure out what grace is in Judaism, I came across this amazing teaching from Mo Moses Maimonides. And Maimonides is like the major thinker of the Middle Ages for Jews. Maimonides referenced grace as God's overflowing effervescence. And when you think about I mean, the first thing that came to my mind was Alka-Seltzer. You know, you drop the two tablets in and then, you know, all the bubbles keep flowing out. And it happens because it's the nature of Alka-Seltzer coming into contact with water. It's not like the Alka-Seltzer decides to give you anything. It's not that um, 
there's a will involved. It's simply the nature of Alka-Seltzer, the nature of water and what happens when the two come together. So as I read more on Maimonides, it's, he seemed to be saying, at least in my mind, that grace is what happens when God and creation come together. Now, as I'm gonna show you in just a second, God and creation are always together because creation is an extension of the divine. So I come at this, I started with, with Maimonides, but I'm coming at this through a Kabbalistic lens, uh, a Kabbalistic theological lens, which I'm gonna define for you in just a second. So because I am totally technophobic, Rabbi is going to, yeah, there you go. She's going to run the slides. So you can flip to the next one though. It's, it says the same thing, that's the cover. Okay, so here's my definition of grace. Grace is God's unlimited, unconditional, unconditioned, and all-inclusive love for all creation. And basically what we're going to do for the next hour or so is to unpack the sentence. What does it mean by unlimited, unconditional, unconditioned, and all-inclusive? And, and what's love? But first got to start with what's God? So let's flip to the next slide. So in the Hebrew Bible, God is revealed in, or God reveals God's own self. I'm gonna do my best to avoid saying himself, but God re reveals God's self to Moses at the burning bush. So you can take it as history if you like, I take it more as parable. I think Bible stories are written by actual human beings and they're trying to teach me something. The Bible is, among many other things, a philosophy book. So in that story, Moses says to God, so you want me to go back to Egypt and tell the people that you know, they should follow me? You're going to liberate them from, from slavery under Pharaoh. Who should I tell them sent me? Because if I go back and I say I was talking to a shrub, eh, they're not going to be so impressed. So who sent me? And God's first response is the word ehie. E-H-Y-E-H, Echia, Asher, Echia. Most English Bibles say, I am that I am, or I am what I am, or I will be what I will be. But none of them are all that accurate, I don't think. Because first of all, Hebrew doesn't have a present tense for the verb to be. So you can't say, I am anything. So uh, what God is saying is more a gerund so God would be saying, when God says, ehia, eyeing, forever eyeing. God is the singular, eternal, dynamic eyeing of the universe. So that's a little confusing, I think. When, I'm going to try to unpack it. When God gives the Ten Commandments to people, there's a midrash that says, the only thing God said was the first word of the 10, which was I, I am the Lord your God, but said I. And when God said I, everybody passed out. And the Kabbalistic reading of that Midrash is, there's only one I in the universe, it's God. You are an extension of that I. You are um, a version of that eye, which is what it means to be the image and likeness of God. You are, uh, God is eyeing as you, though you don't usually think of it that way. But when God reveals the eternal um, omnipresent eye, all the little eyes, all the little egos, all the little uh, sense of self disappears and the people pass out. So knowing that, back to the burning bush story, knowing that the eyeing idea, the ehia idea is a little bit too radical. God then says to Moses, and I'm paraphrasing, goes, wait, 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 don't go back and tell them that eyeing sent you because then they'll all have this mystical experience and no one will be around anymore. Tell them, and then he gives Moses the yud heh vav -Hey, the unpronounceable four letter word of God. It's a stand in really for eyeing. And then later, because it's unpronounceable and considered too holy to pronounce, even if we knew how to pronounce it, the rabbis came up with an alternative altogether, and that's Adonai, Lord. So, 
But God never says that. When God says yod hey vav hey, God doesn't say Lord. God says yod hey vav hey, yod hey vav hey. Like ehia is another form of the Hebrew verb uh, to be or to happen. And so the best, my estimation, the best understanding of the YHVH or the yod hey vav hey is what's on this slide, the happening, happening as all happening. There's nothing other than God in the universe. And you can, the Kabbalists get this from Ein Od Mil Vado in Deuteronomy 4.35. If you look at it in context, it means there's no one, no other God next to God. But the way the, the mystics use it, it's literally Ein Od, there's nothing else but him, but God. There's nothing else but God. And then I quoted from uh, Mishulam Heller, just to make it clear, or more, less murky maybe, there's really nothing in the world other than the divine. While it may seem that there are other things, everything is really God and the happening of God. That means you and me, that you imagine yourself to be separate from God. But that's impossible because the entire universe is God. Now, God is bigger still, but never other than or separate from the natural world that you and I inhabit. So this is crucial to, to what we're gonna be talking about. So let me stop here and, and see if, if I've lost you already. You wanna jump in and just talk about this theology because it's not the one you read in the prayer book. It's not the standard one that we get you know, in, in uh, adult ed where God is a supernatural being, meaning outside of nature. This is the Kabbalistic understanding, the Hasidic understanding, uh, the contemporary Jewish mystical understanding that God is, as David Cooper says, a verb happening in, with, and as everything. So the theology, I guess we may have talked about this before, but the theology is called, oh, I can't, I was going to type this out for you and mm -hmm. somehow. <clears throat> so did you? Yes. Uh, there we go. Uh, Rabbi, um, yeah. could, one of the fundamental tenets of Reformed Judaism is that we are partners with God. How, how does this fit with that idea? Well, it depends how you want to understand partner. So mm -hmm. it's, if you imagine partner as two separate beings working together, that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, the relationship in the, in the Jewish mystical tradition, the rela or there's no such thing, in one strand of the Jewish mystical tradition, there's the relationship between God and you and God and, and nature is similar to that of the ocean and a wave. So oh, every wave is unique and distinct, but every wave is the waving of the ocean. And to the extent that you understand that you are a wave of God's infinite oceanic being, uh, that's, that, that's how you would partner with God, knowing that you are an extension of God here for a specific purpose, which Genesis calls um, being a blessing to all the families of the earth, Genesis 12, 3. But it's, there's no separateness. I mean, that's the key. There's no separateness between you and God. That's not to say that you are all of God, but it is to say God is all of you, just like the ocean and the wave. No wave is the entirety of the ocean, but the ocean is the entirety of every wave. Thank so you. It is, it is different. Thank you. So you can agree or disagree. You should agree, but you could disagree if you choose. Uh, but um, is it clear? Carly's got a hand up, it says, Carly. Uh, yes, um, so when you're praying to God, are you praying to the happening so that you're hoping for a different outcome? Yeah, that's a great question. Let's not answer it. Anybody else? <laughs> that's like a very hard question. And, and it, because we're so used to, well, here's the answer. I won't try to hedge it. No, <laughs> the answer is, the purpose of prayer in this kind of mystical system is two things. One, it reminds you of your 
communal values. So part of our prayer is to, is to just reinforce the, the values that Judaism holds. But regarding your relationship with God and getting God to change whatever's going on, as we'll see as we go into this grace thing, uh, that doesn't happen. The purpose of, or the, I was just reading this new book on uh, Dove Bear, who's maybe the founder, even though we always say the Baal Shem Tov is the founder of Hasidism, it may be Dove Bear that really organizes it. And his approach to prayer is that just saying the words with complete attention, it's like a mantra, puts you in, awakens you to the fact that you are a happening of God, but you don't ask God for anything. Because as you'll see in a minute, God gives you everything, but it's not always what you want. Uh, does that make sense? You, you can't change reality. Uh, you can't wish it away. You know, you know it, it doesn't work that way. You can't pray and have COVID go away. You can wear a mask and minimize the, the possibility of you getting it and giving it, but you can't get rid of it. Yeah, that was helpful because I feel like my perspective of Judaism sometimes I don't realize just being an American Jew kind of gets diluted from like a Christian standpoint of prayer, um, or at least how I perceive it to be. So that was very clarifying. Okay. Yeah, so you know that's a whole other issue, which we don't have time for, but that's really something that's worth discussing, is how Christianized has our Judaism or our understanding of Judaism become? You know, like Rabbi said, we're doing the word grace to try to reclaim it. When I think grace, I think Christian understanding of grace. And I've talked to my pastor and priest friends, and they'll tell me, oh, grace is, um, you know, God's gift and God bestows it upon whom God wishes to bestow it. And, you, you know, it's this, this gift of God and that, that certain people get and other people don't. That's not what I'm getting from Maimonides. And that's not the image of grace that I'm giving here. But that influence of Christianity is really permeates Judaism. We're gonna talk, I forget what the date is, but I'm gonna do a sermon with, with, the congregate, with your congregation about what makes Judaism unique. Um, and most of the stuff that uh, we used to say made it unique, it's no longer unique because the Christians have it and Muslims have it. and so is there something that is uniquely Jewish? And I think there is something that is uniquely Jewish um, that hasn't yet and probably never will be co-opted by another tradition. And well, that's a big teaser to come to the sermon. So uh, I'm gonna move on. So the theology is just again to quote uh, uh, Rabbi Heller, there's really nothing in the world other than the divine. While it may seem that there are other things, everything is really the divine and the happening of the divine. So that's what, that's the ultimate realization of, of mystic awakening in Judaism is, is to realize that that is true. So let's unpack the definition of grace. So if we can go to the next slide. So if you remember, the original definition, I'll just read it to you. Grace is God's unlimited, unconditional, unconditioned, and all-inclusive love for all creation. So we're going to take up one word at a time. So first with unlimited. To say that God's grace is unlimited, and remember, I'm just saying God because it's so awkward to say the happening, happening is all happening. But to say that God's grace is unlimited is to say that there's no one outside its reach. Right? And this is one way it's, it's different than other traditions. No one, not the sinner, the heretic, the unbeliever, or the differently believing believer, no one is outside God's grace. While one faith group or another may claim to have a monopoly on God's grace, and they do claim them, they're, that, it's mere marketing and in no way reflects the truth of God's unlimited grace. To be unlimited, Maimonides unlimited effervescence, to be unlimited is to mean there's, well, obviously no limits. So nobody is outside the gift of grace. Everybody receives it. And that's hard for some people to accept because we want to be special, you know, we want, oh, I, you know, there but for the grace of God go I. Well, that's true. But when you say that, you see someone who's really suffering and you say, there but for the grace of God go I, 
That's true. But also the other person who's suffering can say, here, with the grace of God, am I? Because God's grace is not limited to individuals and really not limited to any one kind of experience. So I'm just going to keep running through. If you want to jump in, just do so. And let's go to the, the next one. So now unconditional. If something's unconditional, there's nothing you can do to merit it, to earn it, or to avoid it. Right? It's without conditions. So you can't get closer or further away from grace. You can only get more or less grace. You can't get even more, or you even can't get more or less grace. You can only get all of grace. Grace is fundamentally the happening of God in every moment. So I know this is going to sound horrible, but yesterday after Shabbos, I called a friend of mine and just to see how his Shabbos went. And he told me that his aunt had just uh, died from COVID. She was in her 80s. And I'd gone through this a few months ago with my aunt, who was in her 90s, but also died of COVID. And, you know, so I commiserated, we, we talked about it. But his aunt getting COVID and dying from COVID is also part of this divine grace. Because grace is the happening of God, and you and I are the happening of God, and everything that happens with us is the happening of God. So even getting sick and dying is part of this infinite effervescence of the divine. We want, lots of us, we want an escape. There's got to be something I can do, some way to earn a way out, not just me, maybe me and my family, something, I don't mean mask wearing, I mean something magical that I can do or say to have God save me from the horrors of whatever it is I'm facing. And in this concept, this, this version of, of the Jewish concept of grace, there's no avoiding grace, and grace includes the, the positive and negative. You can't have one without the other. You get it all. So grace becomes, well, I'm, I'm going to show you at the end how to work with it. But grace is not an escape. I, I have Christian friends who say, who speak of grace in the, as, a, as a kind of escape. I love Jesus, and I love Jesus so much that he will make sure X doesn't happen to me. And then when X does happen, because X always happens eventually, uh, they'll say, well, my love wasn't strong enough. Or if they can't do that, they'll say, well, this is part of God's plan. I'd rather say it's part of God's plan because the universe is God's plan and it includes COVID and COVID includes so many horrible deaths. I don't know what the number is at the moment. I didn't see it today, but it's all part of the divine unfolding, even though it's horrible. So if you're looking for some comfort here, you're not going to get it. Let's go to the next one. So now it's unconditioned. So we talked about uh, unconditional, meaning you can't avoid it. You can't earn it or escape it. Now it's unconditioned. And that means it's not restricted by our notions of good and bad, just and unjust, desirable and the undesirable. Grace is the fullness of God's infinite love bestowed without filters upon all creation. So the best text for this, I think, is, as I said here, the book of Job. Because So, you know, the story is Job's this innocent guy. He's always doing the right thing. He loves God. And then God sort of, God has a, in the book of Job, God has uh, self-esteem issues. And the devil sort of, not, not tricks, he just says, you know, the devil says to God, uh, the only reason Job loves you is because you give him everything. Job's got 
great kids. His businesses are going well. He's wealthy. He's got a wonderful wife. Everything is perfect. And, you know, so the devil says, if that weren't true, he would hate you like everybody else. So God goes, really? Is that right? So God tests Job and he kills his children. He destroys his business. Ultimately, it goes for another round of horrors and he finally destroys his health. And Job is left in chapter two, sitting on the ground, covered in open oozing sores, scratching himself, himself with broken pieces of pottery uh, in total abject horror. And then his wife walks in and she has, I didn't write it out here, but it's the verse before 2.9 and before 2.10, it's verse 2.9. She walks in and she says to her husband, she's horrified by what he's going through. And she says, why don't you just curse God and die? Why don't you just curse God and die? That's just avoid all this horror and say something horrible and God will kill you. So when I, when I had a congregation, <laughs> I'm not suggesting that Rabbi Wendy do this, but when I had a congregation, um, I encouraged people to make bumper stickers that just said Job 2.9 and to put them on places wherever you saw a John 3.16 bumper sticker or a sign. So, you know, if you go to, um, you don't have NASCAR in Chicago, but you know, whenever you go to these certain sporting events, when we could go to sporting events, there was always someone with a big uh, oak tag sign that said John 3.16. That's from the gospel of John chapter three, verse 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son uh, to save us. All who believe in him shall attain eternal life. So my suggestion was you make another sign that says Job 2.9 and go sit next to the person holding up the John 3.16 sign. And it, no one knows what Job 2.9 is. And you imagine the, the camera panning the crowd and they come up with the John 3.16 and then they come to Job 2.9 and someone's watching going, hmm, I know John 3.16, what's Job 2.9? I'm gonna look this up. Curse God and die! <laughs> Just a little cognitive dissonance because Judaism is not this sugar sweet religion. Christianity offers us an escape from the bad. Judaism doesn't, and Job knows this. So Job says to his wife, don't speak foolishly, shall we not accept the good as well as the bad from God? And that's the key thing. It's unconditioned by your definitions of what's good and evil, what's, what's healthy and unhealthy. You get everything from God because God is everything. And there's no escaping. So Job says, you have to accept the good and the bad from God. This is an incredibly powerful teaching for the practice of equanimity. So can you say, regardless of your theology, but can you say, thank you for whatever happens. So I don't know if I mentioned this last time, but, uh, and Rabbi, if you remember, tell me that I did and I won't repeat myself, though maybe there's someone new here that wasn't on last time. But my Rebbe, Zalman Shakta Shalomi, used to, he's deceased, Allah Shalom, used to, uh, he drove like a Land Rover kind of car and he had this big Tibetan bell hanging from the sun visor on the passenger side. And every time he hit a bump, the bell would ring. And it was really annoying. And I'm, we were together, we were going somewhere and I'm sitting on the passenger side and the bell's going bing, bing, bing. So we're in uh, Boulder, Colorado. And you know, the, the weather causes the, what do you call it? The, when, the, when the ground shifts and the roads aren't smooth, the potholes. So it keeps ringing. And I said, you know, Rebbe, what's, what's with this bell? It's really annoying. And he said, it's my thanks God bell, Baruch Hashem bell. And he said, every time it rings, I say Baruch Hashem or thanks God. That's the way he translated it. I said, okay, why do you do that? He said, because one of these times I'm going to have an accident. And if I have an accident, if I 
maybe a fatal accident, he said. I'll hit something, the bell will ring, and the last thing I will say as I die is thanks God. I should be thankful even for the accident. Now he's assuming no one else is hurt. He's an old man when we're doing this. He's going to run into a tree, probably. <laughs> he's not another person. But he's, he, he's, the, the message was, even my death, even if it's from an auto accident, even my death is from God. And I want to be able to say thanks even for that. That is a very difficult thing to do. I, I'm not saying I have mastered that. I have a bell, though. You can all, <laughs> I have a bell in my car. You can all get bells. I put a bell in my car. I put a bell in my sister's car. Uh, there's a bell in my kids' cars. My brother-in-law took the bell out of my sister's car. He called it the death bell, and he thought it was bad luck. So they, they got rid of their bell. But the message is still very powerful. If you're looking for a sense of tranquility, can you be uh, thankful? Can you at least recognize that everything that comes to you is coming from God, whether it's something you want or something you don't want, something that's good for you or something that you feel is bad for you? It's not that God has a plan. Because again, a lot of my Christian friends will say, oh, it's bad. It looks bad. But God really has a plan, and it's all part of God's plan. So just trust God's plan. That's not what we're saying here, because that still gives you an out. It's that God is all happening, and all happening includes good things and bad things, what the Taoists call the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows of everyday living. That's what you're given, and all of it comes from, in our case, the you know, yod hey vav hey, all of it comes from the divine. Can we be grateful for whatever happens to us? Yeah, Judy. Um, Rabbi Geffen often says at a funeral for a husband or a spouse, she will say, a marriage is everything. It's all the good moments. It's the painful ones. And it's, it's the unhappy moments as well. But I think what, what you're describing a relationship with Yud Vav Hev is like a marriage. It is encompassing. And if you encompass all the moments, then you, I think, have some sort of comfort in that fact. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's right. And that's, I mean, hopefully people hear what she says. We hear her. <laughs> hear the meaning of what she's saying when she says that. Yeah, she's saying, who knows? And, and you never know. But yeah, that's right. And the same is true here, that uh, everything good that happens to you, we always, we always say, why do bad things happen to good people? You can say the same thing. Why do good things happen to good people? Why do good things happen to bad people? Why do bad things happen to bad people? The answer is always the same. Things happen. And all we're saying here is that the happening of all these things is what God is. So let's flip to the next one. So this is going to be our definition of love. So when we're talking about love, don't think of romantic love or even a contractual love. Um, another publisher once asked me to write a book on love in the Bible, which I did. And he hated it, so it never got published. But what he hated was it wasn't romantic love because mostly the love relationships in the Bible are not romantic, right? That's not, that romantic love doesn't even enter into human consciousness for centuries, millennia after the Bible. So it's more contractual. The love, but we're not talking about either one. The love we're talking about isn't quid pro quo. It's not this for that. If we imagine God's love in human terms and expect it to be tender and affectionate, we will be very upset when bad things happen to good people. yod heh vav -Heh is the source, and this is from Isaiah. It's, it says, yod heh vav -Heh says, I create light and dark. I create good and evil. I, yod heh vav -Heh, do all these things. I mean, I don't believe that God actually spoke to Isaiah. I don't know if Isaiah wrote this passage. Whoever wrote it, I, this is what I do believe, 
whoever wrote it experienced what we're talking about that this this uh, infinite divine is the source of everything because like the ocean is a source of beautiful calm waves and tsunamis so yahweh is the source of light and dark good and evil <clears throat> it's again it's not a comforting theology it's not a christian theology which again sort of permeates a lot of Jewish people's thinking about what about God. We want to think of God as all good. But that's not the Jewish position. The Jewish position is that God is just everything or a Jewish position. But if you say God is all good, you have a lot of problems because then what do you do with all the evil in the world? So the Christian answer is Satan. So Satan in Judaism is introduced to us in the book of Job and Satan works for God. Uh, the, the person who wrote it, the book, Joe, used a, a legal model where God is like the ultimate judge and the, the Satan, Satan, is God's prosecuting attorney. And a couple of times a year, Satan runs around the world, collects data, and goes back to a grand jury you know, with the angels, and then they, they go to God and talk about it. Um, that's not the Christian view, where Satan <clears throat> is the enemy of Jesus, Satan is the enemy of God, and that there's this cosmic war going on between the two of them, God and Satan, and it plays out here on earth, and you are on God's side if you're on the side of, of Jesus, and you're on Satan's side if you're not. I mean, that's not, beside the obvious, that's not the Jewish position. Nothing is can be the enemy of God, because God's everything. Or even if you just believe God is all powerful, how can there be another deity that's equally powerful so they can actually battle it out? It doesn't work that way. So, uh, but when we think of God, because we're so influenced by uh, Christianity, we think that God's supposed to be all good, all loving, and then what do we do when things turn out horribly? And there's different ways that we, we get around it. I mean, um, Abraham Joshua Heschel uh, writes eloquently about where was God during the Holocaust? And he says, and I think it's more poetry than theology. I mean, I can't believe it personally, but he says, God is standing with the Jews in the gas chambers. So God is comforting us in our dying moments. I find that you know, if it's an all-powerful God that he seems to believe in, God could have stopped us because we didn't need a Holocaust. God, we didn't need Hitler. Hitler could have choked on a, you know, on a something when he was a baby and died, and the whole World War II and the Holocaust, nothing like that would have happened. But since it did, and you don't want to blame God for it, then you have to come up with some image of God that allows you to avoid blaming God. And so Heschel comes up with this notion of this loving God who stands with us in our moments of horror and suffering. Not saying that you can't feel the presence of God in moments of horror and suffering, only saying that the horror and suffering is also part of the divine unfolding. I create light, I create darkness, I fashion good, I fashion evil, according to the God of Isaiah 45.7. So let me stop there, because that's usually too much. <laughs> so comments on that? You want to go into that? That's Sorry. usually... It sounds like what you're saying is that uh, grace is can be defined as stuff happens, and we'll call it God. But, but we can yeah. call it anything. We can call it... You could call it right. You could call it anything. Right? But, that, but what do you do with that? I mean, that doesn't get... At the end of the day, what do I need this grace for? No, you don't need it for anything. I mean, the, the whole idea, first of all, you get it, you can't help it, you just got it. So it's like, you know, it's, it's like, it's like um, you know, what are you gonna do with it? Well, the only thing you can do with it is recognize what it is. And then if you recognize it deeply, it leads to a sense of tran tranquility because then you realize, yeah, bad things happen, good things happen. I'm not being punished, I'm not being rewarded no one's being punished or rewarded. I'm simply living life and the nature of life is 10,000 joys, 10,000 sorrows. And I can just go through them all being 
uh, I guess you'd say grace filled, knowing that it's all part of the this unfolding over which I have no control. And according to Reb Zalman, anyway, grateful that I'm experiencing whatever it is I'm experiencing. I mean, it's a deeply mystical attitude toward this, but it's not comforting. And that's usually where, where we get caught up. Mike wants to jump in. Mike Rosenthal. I just had to turn it off. I mean, I, I, a couple of questions about that. The, the first thing is, if we have, where's free will in all this? Because if everything is God's plan, which I hear often from uh, different religions, why should we bother to try to do anything different? And doesn't that just lead to nihilism? Because people are like, well, if it's going to happen anyway, why should I care? Yeah. So you wouldn't want to like, take that question back, would you? <laughs> no, that's a, it's a great question. And it's a very difficult thing to wrestle with. Do we have free will or not? Um, my answer, and it's just the way I deal with it, I, ha I think we have what I call functional free will. It feels like free will to us. But in fact, we don't. We really, it's, but it's not that you're programmed. It's just that things happen because the conditions are such that they have to happen. So, for example, um, so, so, okay, we'll, we'll take my aunt again. So, so my aunt dies from COVID. It's not a punishment. It's, it's, it's just, she gets it because A, the nature of reality is such that COVID emerges. Uh, the conditions under which a 91-year-old woman was existing made her vulnerable to it. Because of where she lived in a nursing home and all that coming in, and it, it just happened. And she couldn't, she wasn't healthy enough to, to get through it. She died from it. So did she have a choice? So I would say no. You could say, well, she didn't have to go into the nursing home. But in fact, she did because there was no one to take her uh, in the family. And there, there, she could stay at home, but she couldn't take care of herself. So she had to go somewhere where they would take care of her. In, in other words, the conditions on the ground always produce the results they're going to produce, and there's no way around it. When you know there's no way around it, now this is a little tricky because I'm trying to avoid free will. When you know there's no way around it, a certain kind of grace emerges in you, a certain kind of tranquility that allows you to deal with it without losing your... I say cool, but that sounds a little simplistic, without, without losing your sense of balance. So nothing happens randomly, right? Nothing in the universe is random. If, if things were really random, then an elephant could suddenly appear in your room where, where the Zoom call is and, at any second, because that's just random. That can't happen. Um, here in, in Tennessee, it never snows where I live. So the temperature right now is in the 70s and there's no way it's gonna snow. Not because God decided not to make it snow, but because snow can't happen when, you're, when the, the temperature outside is in the 70s. When the temperature drops and if there's enough moisture in the air, you can get snow or sleet or something. Not because anyone decides, but because the conditions are such that that happens. If you understand that everything happens the way it happens because the conditions are such that nothing else can happen, whatever happens, you just move through it with a sense of grace because you realize, well, that's just what it is. I can't, I can't fight it. So how do I just move through it? In the Talmud, Rabbi Akiva gives an analogy. And I don't know if this is true, but this is what he says. He was caught in a, uh, he was on a ship and the ship is caught in a storm and the ship goes down and everyone drowns except him. So uh, people said to him, how did you survive the shipwreck? And he said, every time a wave came in, I bent into it. 
I didn't stand up to it. I didn't try to resist it. I didn't try to escape it. I simply bent into it. In the Taoist scripture, the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu uh, talks about a, a tree that is rigid. And when the wind comes, <coughs> the tree snaps and breaks. But a tree that's flexible will just go with the wind. And when the wind stops, the tree comes back. We're trying to be the, 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 the flexible tree. Um, and I, I think I, I'm going to suggest later that Shabbat is our practice for being the flexible tree. Um, but yeah, you don't have, you don't really have control over anything. I don't even know if you have choice to be flexible or not. I, I'm not sure. I mean, it's really, you can get into the science of free will and the neuroscientists will tell you there's no part of your brain that is unconditioned by your genes and all the rest of it. So that there is no part of you that makes decisions. There are all these studies that say, you know, like if I raise my hand, um, the decision to raise my hand happens unconsciously. So it's not like I go, oh, I think I'm gonna raise my hand like this. My hand just happens, you know, I'm talking and this is just the way it works and I, that's what I did. But I didn't egocentrically plan it out. It just happens. Then my ego says, well, I'm trying to make a point. So I raise my hand. But things just happen. And we have to learn to go with it. Now, it doesn't sound, I, you know, even as I say it, it's not comforting. I keep saying that because there's no escape as, um, or no exit, as Sartre you know, said. There's no way around this. Reality is reality, and you have to deal with it. <clears throat> Can you deal with it with a sense of flexibility and tranquility and grace? I think you can, and I, but I think the, the um, conditions for do, the condition for doing that is to understand what we're talking about. So I guess hold on to all of that because I'm cognizant of the time. I don't know if it's, I, I guess I keep trying to put too much into these, these talks with you, but I can go over a little bit uh, if you can. So here's the, the next slide. So the next one, yeah, the next one after that. So to live with grace, okay, okay, there it goes. Um, is that, okay, doesn't matter. We can take them in any order. Is this the <laughs> one you want? I'm sorry. This, no, no, this, this is good given what we just talked about. To live with grace, okay. to live with a sense of radical acceptance, resisting nothing that is given and working with it all to bring yourself closer and closer to the realization of the divine in, with, and as all things. That's all we can do a sense of radical acceptance, whatever it is, I'm not resisting. Because the resistance creates an unnecessary tension. And that tension then spells out into theologies and what do I got to, going to pray my way out of this or I'm, I'm being punished for something. If it's radical acceptance, there's nothing to defend. There's nothing wrong with you. It's reality happens because the way it does, because the conditions are such that nothing else could happen. And when you realize that, you start to realize that divine is in, with, and as everything. So go to the, the next one. So God doesn't want anything uh, from us. Uh, or for us. And this is really tough, especially in Judaism, where God seems to want 613 things. But we're not talking about the God of the rabbis. We're talking about the divine in, in general. So God doesn't want, uh, doesn't want at all. God doesn't lack anything. God doesn't desire anything. So you find in Deuteronomy this fabulous thing. You've heard this a million times. But this text... Uh, See, I, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. I set before you birthing and dying, blessing and cursing. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the divine, hearing the divine, and achieving union with Vekut, union with the divine. For the divine is your life and length of days. So we usually read this as a choice between opposites. Moses is saying, I set you before today life and prosperity or death and adversity. I've set before you uh, life and death, blessing and cursing. So choose one or the other. And I'm suggesting Moses says, choose life. 
But if you read it from the mystical perspective, it's not an either or, it's a both and. I'm setting before you life and prosperity and death and adversity. I'm setting before you birthing and dying, blessing and cursing. Choose life, you get it all because that's what life is. So choose it anyway, because the, the op, you know, you can choose death and, and suicide, my, my personal understanding of suicide is that suicide happens because the conditions under which a person is living are so horrific or debilitating or whatever the, the right term is that they cannot help but do that. So I, I don't, I mean, I, I realize uh, that, you know, I've had suicide in my family and I know people get mad at the suicide, the person who did it. But I, I think that's a mistake. I think a person commits suicide because at the moment they do it, they don't see a way out. Now, of course, you go to therapy, there's maybe drugs, there's maybe other things you can do. I'm not saying it's inevitable, but I'm saying that this is not a free will act. This is a person responding to conditions that are so debilitating and so horrible that this is all they can come up with. And I think the only response to a suicide and, and if you've experienced suicide in your family, this may be harsh, but I think the only response to a suicide is compassion. This person's pain was too much and it's not your fault and it's not their fault. And only compassion works with that. It's just the conditions were such they couldn't do anything else. So what the text is saying here, as I read it, is choose life, is to choose the whole mess, the whole Megillah, right? The good and the bad, the, the just and the unjust, Choose that, live with that, learn to live with the madness because Yurhevave is life and the length of days. It's all God happening. You're part of that happening. And if you resist it, then you're actually losing out on whatever love there is to be had. But you can't have love only. There's going to be the opposite. So let me let me stop there for a second um because that's another harsh these are harsh teachings you've signed up for grace and you're looking for something sweet and i'm offering you this uh anybody need to respond to that yeah you know you say that things happen because the conditions are such that that's the only thing that can happen but can't you change the conditions I mean, if a, if a if a person committed suicide let's say because of great financial hardship couldn't you contribute some money to them and, and help change that condition so that you would in effect be interjecting and changing yeah, the change right but when they the answer is yes but the conditions that were present for that person when they took their life were such that taking their life is the only thing to do if someone had stepped in seen their financial suffering let's say and said wait i can help the conditions have changed and they wouldn't do it they, but no then way. we do have we do have some agency in this thing right yeah, I, I mean, that's the hard part is, is the, the notion of agency. So, so for example, you see a per let's just stick with your example. So you see a person in financial difficulty, extreme financial difficulty. Are you free to help that person or not? Now, before you jump in and say, yeah, of course you could, but let's say you don't. Did you sit down and say, hey, I just don't want to help. I, I'm, I don't know, I'm too cheap or, 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 you know, I just, is it a free will choice not to help? Or are the conditions of your life such that helping is not an option for you? And I don't mean that you don't have enough money. I just mean something psychological that you feel that's not the thing to do. I was going, went on my walk this morning, uh, actually Shabbos morning, yesterday morning. And there was this homeless guy. Like, I'm assuming he was homeless. A lot of people here look like they're homeless when they're actually, I mean, I, there, there are some people here who are millionaires, but because of where I live, they, they dress in a way that I would think is, you know, really, they look like they're homeless. But anyway, this guy I was walking around and then another man, these are people in their 70s. Another guy was crossing the street and saw him and started yelling at him. And he was pointing at him and he said, welfare, welfare, welfare. He was chanting the word welfare. And the, the homeless guy, if he was in fact that, 
turns to him and say, is that what you say when your president loses the election? <laughs> it was a weird conversation. But the guy who is chanting welfare, 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 never occurred to him that this guy might need help, financial help. It never occurred to him. It only occurred to him to curse the person in need and chant welfare, welfare, welfare. Now, why does he do that? I bet he doesn't have a clue. I, I imagine if you sat down and you said, why do you hate welfare? He'll come up with something, you know, uh, as long as you don't bring up social security, which he was probably on, and that's a kind of welfare. So he's got his own shtick that he's living under. And it's reinforced by, you know, his Facebook friends and his church and whatever other organizations he belongs to. D is he free, at least in that moment, was he free to do anything else other than curse this guy, welfare, welfare, welfare. I'm suggesting, no, he was stuck. He was stuck. So theoretically, he could have helped if the guy needed help. But in practice, I don't know. I, I, just, I just don't know. So Lynn has her hand up. What about the mitzvot? Where does that fit into the whole exercise of choice and free will? Or, or not, or predeterminism. Yeah, so I would think, uh, in fact, why don't we, let's just jump ahead. Um, so then the next slide, I think, and, and I'm gonna answer the question or try to. Uh, oh no, pass, we'll go, we'll go past that. Go, go to the one that says um, Judaism is spiritual, that, that one. Yeah, what, back, back. I'm so sorry, I can't do this myself. There you go. So God's unlimited, unconditioned, and unconditional love is reality itself. Each instant is an expression of God's grace, good or bad. You can't earn it. You can't merit it. You simply receive it. What you do with what you receive is up to you. So that's the, the level of agency. Now, I would even, I would be happy to have an argument if you're even free there, but let's just say you are. What you do with what you receive is up to you. And that's where I think the mitzvot come in. The mitzvot give us something to do if we are in a position to do it. So in other words, I don't, and I have no idea what uh, Lynn, right? Uh, I, don't, I have no idea what your practice is, you know, Jewish practices. But um, my guess is you don't do all of the mitzvot. So um, why not? You know, are you free to do them? Well, you might say I'm free, but really why, why not? Um, but for, I'll just use myself as an example. So um, we're supposed to give away 10% of our earnings to, to, the, to charity. So I don't know if I do or I don't, because I don't do the math. But there's a tradition that says you walk around with a tzedakah purse with money in it so that you give away every day so that by the end of the year, you've given your tzedakah. Now, these people didn't have federation when they came up this idea. There's other ways of doing this. But I used to give money to like the homeless guy. Then I stopped. And I stopped because uh, I'm in a 12-step program. I'm in Overeaters Anonymous. And I was teaching an Overeaters Anonymous workshop. And I went with two friends. This is in DC area. And we went to a McDonald's, which is not the best place for <laughs> someone to go for Overeaters Anonymous. But I get just the round eggs, no bun, no, no. I eat, I eat as simply as possible if I'm in that situation. But Normally, I don't go to McDonald's. Anyway, we went to McDonald's. We're sitting around uh, waiting for the next thing to start. And a homeless guy comes in and he comes up and he asks for money. So my initial response is to give him money. But my friends spoke first and they said, no, we're not giving you anything. And I was like, wow, that's very judgmental. So the guy walked away and then he came back a little while later. And I thought, you know, we should give them money. And they said, no, we're not giving you money. And they said to the guy, look, we know, because they were um, not just an OA, they were also alcoholics. 
And they said, look, we know what you're going to do with the money. And we're not going to support that. We're not giving you any money. We will, on the other hand, buy you breakfast. And then the guy says, I don't want breakfast. And they say, oh, we know you don't want breakfast. You want money to go buy drinks. So the guy walks in. Then he comes back a third time. And this time he says, OK, I'll take breakfast. So they went and they bought him whatever he wanted to eat for breakfast. And they, let him, they paid for it with more than enough money. And they gave him you know, whatever the change was. He got to keep the change. So then we had this discussion after he had left. But how do you, if I had just given him money, was I helping him or not? And they said, from a 12-step perspective, they said, no, you're not helping the guy at all. Feed him, clothe him, help with you know, housing if, if, not, you know, if that's appropriate, but you don't just give money. So I stopped doing that act of tzedakah. And I take what I would have normally given and I give it to projects that help the homeless, but I don't feed a habit. And it took me a long time to even get, I'm not even sure I'm 100% comfortable with it, but it, it, it took a while to get over the, the mitzvah idea. So my conditioning changed learning about tzedakah from the 12 step perspective. Does that, does that make sense? I, I don't know if you follow that, but but my, my mental conditioning changed. And now, now I'm, I don't feel free to give them money because I think I'm, I'm actually doing more harm than good. Now you could argue the other way. I'm, I'm not wedded to this, but I'm just trying to say that even when it comes to mitzvot, they're not blind. We have to do something with them. So I'm suggesting, I will just go through one of these. Um, yeah, give me the next slide. Um, so mitzvot become, if done well, I think, use thing mitzvot wisely, they become tools for working with grace to benefit life and the living. Because the, the mission of the Jew is, as I mentioned, Genesis 12, 3, to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. So the mitzvot have to work in that regard. Giving this guy money wasn't helping, I guess. So the next slide talks about Shabbos, I think, yeah. So... To me, if there's one mitzvah that really speaks to grace, grace-filled living, it's Shabbos. To spend one day out of the week without, like I said here, grasping, earning, clinging, working, any kind of addiction, a, a day of divine play devoted to singing, lovemaking, storytelling, adoration of the divine prayer, kind of thing, and, and gratitude for what, what's happening, good or bad. Shabbat becomes an incredibly powerful to weekly tool to um, promote the idea of grace that I'm suggesting and to live that idea in a way that is grace-filled. And that would be a complete remaking of Shabbos. I mean, that's not the way I grew up Orthodox. Not, that's not the Shabbos I was trained to observe. But if, if we're going to use the mitzvot as tools for grace-filled uh, grace living, then I think Shabbat becomes this powerful way of living without, living radically or living out the perspective of radical acceptance. So let me, let me stop there and see if that speaks to anybody. So actually, let me ask Rabbi Wendy, what, what do you think about the notion of Shabbos as, I'm not putting you on the spot, you certainly don't have to agree with me. I, I totally agree. <laughs> You know, um, you know, I, I think I, the only framing that I think is interesting in this regard, but I guess, you know, the, the whole framing of grace is it completely destroys the notion of exceptionalism, right? Like there is no, which we, I think as humans, certainly as Western humans um, are likely uncomfortable with on a very profound level. We, we, um, we like to think of ourselves as exceptional, as a group, as individuals, yeah, whatever that people. is. Yeah, I, well, even forget that, right? For sure that I'm thinking more just in 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 a universal construct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just you know, we are Americans, which makes us special. We we have our own we have our own rights, um, which mean we deserve something. Um, and, and, and it kind of implies that others don't. There, there's just a whole notion of exceptionalism that I think this, this framework um, eliminates, which I think is, is powerful, but also challenging. 
Um, and then there's Shabbat, which I guess in its grandest construct isn't exceptional. You know, it can be radically inclusive, um, but it is this, I just, I find a tension here in terms of, is this imitatio day, you know, like, so is the goal of, of, uh, of our observance of Shabbat a mimicking of God um, for the purpose of experiencing or gaining proximity to that feeling of grace, whatever, however we might make that manifest? Um, or is it just sort of like pretending because all of this is just going to be anyway, you know, to the, to the, I think Mike made that point initially, or and I think Jody actually re referenced that too, which is, which is okay. But if all of this just is and what it is, you know, at a certain point we have to make the choice um, of the, you know, the, the type of life we, we, we want to live if we are able to make choices. Um, and in that, I would say, I, I tend to think we are able to make choices. And so I would say then the practice of Shabbat is a really beautiful one. Um, but just, you know, I think then there is that opposite where you began, which is, well, so, so <laughs> maybe I'm we're not come, making the choices. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, Carly has her hand up. So yeah. Carly, just hang on a second. Cause I'm just curious. So, I mean, I haven't had a synagogue since um, I turned 50. So that was 20 years ago. So, um, when I did have a synagogue, our Shabbat was sort of just a liberal version of like anyone else's Shabbos. When I left the synagogue and I started running Shabbos retreats, uh, we would start early in the morning with Qigong, you know, the Chinese you know, movement exercises. We have a Qigong teacher. We would spend the day in, in practicing Qigong, which is all about being graceful movement and learning to be not the rigid tree, but the, you know, the waving tree. We would practice Qigong. We would do all kinds of chanting. We would study text together. Um, and we had a lot of you know, free time just to, to chat and, and do whatever you wanted uh, at this beautiful mountain retreat center. That to me would be my Shabbat. If I had a synagogue, I don't think I could do that there. Uh, um, Synagogue imposes a structure for lots of good reasons. I'm not saying this is wrong, but I wonder how you would take Shabbat as a day of radical acceptance um, and how you would work that into a service. I'm not going to put you on the spot how to do that, but it's just something that I would wrestle with um, if, I, if I were bringing this into a synagogue. I think, I think it's it's... It's a difficult question to answer. And, I, and I, you want to say yeah, something? And, yeah, and I would say, I don't know that I would conceive of personally, you know, making the synagogue the vessel of Shabbat. I think it's the synagogue's obligation to, um, or the synagogue's opportunity or invitation to empower people to figure out how to navigate a Shabbat that is meaningful to them. Um, because, I don't think people should be at synagogue for 25 hours. I think they should live their lives, you know, to, to, to your point about, you know, Shabbos is a pretty uh, massive encounter in a confined place of time. But, but I think that for sure is a powerful question about like, what, what would that look like to empower folks around, you know, yeah. what does it actually mean to have a Shabbat or to have Shabbos? But if you were like looking around this group, if we were to spend an hour asking, I mean, this is actually a pretty Shabbat observant crew who's here. Um, many of the folks who are here are pretty Shabbat observant. And I, just knowing some of their Shabbat practices um, as individuals, they're very, very diverse. Um, mm, right. that's so, cool you know, like it's a, which is cool. I think that's yeah, like a, a good win for, yeah, win for the Jews, win for yeah, humanity. Yeah. <laughs> I, once a month, um, in, when I had a show once a month, we would do Shabbat out in the woods, in where there's place where you go trails, you know, walk, hiking trails, and we would gather in the parking lot. We would do a little bit of Torah study, leaving the people with something from the parsha um, mm -hmm. to discuss, and then we all went. We went together, but we weren't. You know, we were following the same path because we didn't want to get lost, but we walked the same path. Um, but we didn't necessarily, we weren't 
communing with one of the, we were talking in pairs or whatever about, about the Torah portion and the question that I posed. And then when the path brought us back to uh, the clearing where we ended, that's where we'd have Kiddush and stuff like that. Um, it, it worked for a while, but eventually um, some people started turning it into an aerobic thing. And they would see, they would try to walk as fast as possible. And they ruined the whole, the whole Shabbos experience by making it aerobic. Shabbat is not necessarily aerobic. So Carly and Steve, and then I probably have to wrap it up. We're already over time. But Carly, go ahead. Carly, is um, it cold where you are? <laughs> I'm always cold. And plus it's just very comfortable. Wow, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> made by love from my aunt so like to wear it um but i suppose like what i've been gathering from the conversation is um like that grace god's gonna do what god does we can't control that but it's almost like grace is that reminder of how we treat each other because that's all that's factual is like how we communicate with each other God is this thing. We can't control what God does, but at least we can control how we interact with each other and showing grace to each other during trying times. I mean, I, said, I, I like the idea. I don't know if it's true. I, I Either I'm really Pollyannish, <laughs> Pollyannish. Uh, I think people do the best they can, even when they're doing horrible things. I, I think that some people are really broken and they do these awful things to one another and to themselves, and they should be, you know, locked up. But um, the the Alter Rebbe, Reb Shneur Zalman of Liadi, one hundred and seventy something years ago, maybe, he had this idea that uh, people fall along a bell curve. Now he didn't have the term bell curve, but it, that's what he was talking about. And so, you know, bell curve is, is just, there's a few people at one end and most people are in the middle and a few people at the other end. So he would talk about the people at the far, he said, God has to manifest this, this bell curve of human possibility because God is infinite. Therefore, there has to be infinite possibility. And at one end of the bell curve, he had what are called the uh, tzadikim, so the righteous ones. And right next to them were the almost tzadikim. So the tzadikim are people who couldn't do a bad thing ever. It never occurs to them. They only do good. And the people right next to them are people who uh, uh, have, have an inclination once in a while to do something bad, but they could never act on it. So the tzadikim, pure tzadikim, never has a negative thought. The people right next to the tzadikim on the bell curve have a negative thought once in a while, but never act on it. And he said, those people, the righteous, get absolutely no credit for being righteous because that's how they're created. They're not deciding how to be, that they should be good. They're just good. They can't help themselves. So God says, well, that's just the way it is. They don't get any, any credit for that. On the other end of the spectrum, he said, are the rasha'im, the evil ones. And there's the, the complete so, sociopath, psychopath, who's always thinking of evil things to do that's the extreme one. And then right next to that one is one who every once in a while has a good thought, but can't act on it, only does bad things. And uh, the Alter Rebbe says, God doesn't punish those people because they are stuck. They can't, they, they, they're not choosing to be evil. They're simply carrying the, inf the, the evil end of God's infinite spectrum. So they're not punished. Now you, you got to take you got to put them away. You don't want them wandering around the street because they do terrible things. But you can't say um, they've chosen to be evil. They're just stuck in that end of the spectrum. Someone's got to be there. So that's them. In the middle, he talks about the benoni, the, the in-betweeners, the people in the big hump. And he said, that's, that's us. And he says, not agreeing with me necessarily, he says, those people have a choice that they have enough good thoughts and enough evil thoughts and they could go toward the evil thoughts or toward the good thoughts and they're constantly wrestling with how to how to behave now i'm i'm just saying if you're that may not that's what he says you know i i tend to disagree that even even in between 
a lot of us are, are if not all of us are trapped in our conditioning. Um, which is why I think part of Shabbat is to, and this again, is there's, a, there's an inconsistency in what I'm saying, because I, I think there is this thing called functional free will, where it feels like I'm making a choice. And observing Shabbat feels like I'm making a choice, regardless of how you observe it. It seems like I'm choosing to do that. So I can't avoid the sense that I'm choosing. But philosophically, I wonder if I'm actually if I hadn't been raised the way I was raised, if I would make that choice. Um, so I'm, I'm not disagreeing, I'm just giving another, another alternative. Uh, so Steve, it looks like we're gonna give you the last word. We'll give Rabbi the last word, but I will have the pen ultimately. Um, am I unmuted now? Yeah, yes. you're fine. Okay. Uh, you unmuted me, oh, Wendy, and then I went. I tried. It's fine. I should yeah. never try to do anything with muting or unmuting <laughs> anyone. So. Okay. Um, uh, thank you for, for this uh, very provocative um, uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I think at the beginning you mentioned uh, Maimonides, yes? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I keep hearing in, in my head just ringing out um, – what for me is Maimonides, almost like an admonition. Uh, stop thinking that Maimonides uh, reacts like you. Uh, uh, the, sorry, stop thinking that God reacts like you. God doesn't have human qualities. God doesn't have uh, 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 human emotions. Uh, don't go being uh, anthropomorphic, which is for me a very useful um a very useful way of looking at things. So I, I, I have your PowerPoint also arrayed all the papers in front of me on my desk. So, so um, uh, I, I look at the definition of grace and I move over to the topic sentence of another slide that says, God doesn't want anything from us or for us. God doesn't want at all. I think that's true. Um, however, um, I want to um, uh, offer the possibility that there's some legitimacy in considering what uh, we need to do in um, living in a, in a creation that is characterized by uh, God's unlimited, unconditional, uh, unconditioned and all-inclusive love for all creation. Um, and for, for, I want to suggest that that turns out to be uh, very legitimate choices uh, that we make um, in finding our way to um, uh, 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 respond to that which we actually can't define in human language, that which we can't uh, uh, depict or illustrate, yet at some deep level, maybe the yud dalit ayin level, we know that it's there, and in some way, shape, or form, um, let's say even on Shabbat, as using Shabbat as an example, that may in fact be our response um, uh, 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 to that. So, um, so, so Steve, uh, let me let me just yeah. interrupt because I'm not sure everyone knows what you mean by the the yada, the yud dalad ayin level. Just define sure, that. Sure, sure. So that's that's there there are, there are a couple of Hebrew words for knowing. Um, yada is, in, in my opinion, uh, a knowing that actually is uh, deeper than, higher than, wider than um, my knowing that I have this piece of paper. Uh, it's the knowing that I know that uh, I should still be married to my wife. Don't ask me to explain it to you, but I just know that. Uh, only it's deeper than that. I hope, does that I help? To do with her telling you that. What's that? <laughs> it has nothing to do with her telling you that. <laughs> no, no, well... <laughs> Oh, she would tell me. Um, in, in any event, um, uh, what, I, what I'm thinking here is uh, uh, we, we have two, I don't want to say two worlds, but we have two, two, two um, uh, parts of our uh, uh, human reality and human consciousness. One part of it is uh, some sense of this grace that we can't actually ever define in any better or clearer way than you have than you have done. I see your language as language of suggestion and and uh, uh, um, that points to something beyond what the words are. Um, and how how then do I uh, uh, what do I do about that? 
uh, well, I have set before you today life and death, uh, death and adversity. I love how you have it here, birthing and, and birthing and dying, blessing and curse. Uh, go for it. Be in it and, and respond and respond to it. Um, understanding at all times that uh, my, my, my actions and my deeds and my words are Lashon B'nai Adam, which everything I'm doing is human and not God. Okay, but let me let me ask because I mean, if you can bear with us, so as two rabbis are going to go at this and uh oh, did I get outed just now? And, and Rabbi Wendy didn't jump in. <laughs> so this notion of yada, this other kind of knowing, is absolutely crucial. Now we we didn't even go there until you brought it up, but right. underlying my entire understanding of reality is this notion that Rabbi Steve is articulating of another level of consciousness that you and I have in us already, but maybe block or, or maybe just haven't, I don't know, found it or something. But there's this other level of consciousness that when we access it, makes everything we're saying second nature. You, you know exactly fr from that deeper knowing that everything is a happening of the divine. You know exactly how to maneuver through life in, as, in a manner that makes you a blessing. The, the challenge is what do we do to cultivate or to, see, all the words are wrong, but what do we do to cultivate or to come into contact with that deeper consciousness? To me, it, it, there's different ways, but meditation is one, chanting is one. Um, th this and, and Judaism in the most conventional forms of Judaism don't usually talk about this, but this is central to, to Judaism that there is this other level of consciousness. I mean, there's five levels of consciousness in the Hasidic system, but the, the deepest or the highest or whatever you want to call it is the, the awareness that everything is the happening of God. And then as that translates into your everyday existence, it's a choiceless kind of behavior. You just know how to be graceful and grace-filled in every situation. So yeah, that's, that's a perfect way to end, just sort of leaving it that there's so much more to this. But it's not, but, but it's not abstract. Um, so Steve, is there something you do to cultivate that consciousness? Um, you mean by way of particular practice? Mm -hmm. um, that's a very interesting question. I don't know. Um, I might, I might, I might do it in the in the. Uh, this will sound odd in the practice of music. I might do it in staring at pictures of my grandchildren for hours at a time. Um, I might do it by walking out and breathing. I also might do it by studying uh, Torah. I know that sounds sort of trite and weird, maybe, but uh, uh, when I turn it and turn it and turn it again, and it just keeps exploding in different ways, um, I, might, I might do it... Uh, 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 in, in that way. Um, just one other comment. Uh, you referred to um, uh, yud hey vav hey as a, a, a gerund, yeah? Um, sometimes I think it's a participle, uh, <laughs> as a, a sort of ad adjectival, as in, oh, okay, this is, uh, this is a, a, a dimension of life and being in the world, you know? Um, Anyway, I don't want to get too far off into my personal rabbit hole here. <laughs> <laughs> rabbit hole, rabbi hole. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that completely. Um, you know, one of the things that, and, and we can end with this because I know it's going long, but one of the things that really bugs me about most of this, the one of the things that bothers me about conventional Judaism is that rabbis weren't trained I don't know. Did you go to HUC or JTS or? I went to uh, what they called in the old days JIR on West 68th Street. Ah, okay. It was uh, HUC. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Wendy, where did you go? HUC. 
HAC. So me too. Um, <laughs> nobody there ever talked this way. Nobody there said, you know, there's, there's practices in Judaism, contemplative practices, including study, like uh, Rabbi said, um, that can take you into this alternative consciousness. Um, and so, be, and I would say, because they didn't, we went to Buddhism or, or Hinduism or something else uh, because we didn't know it was in our own tradition. So uh, we I, I think one of the tasks that has to happen uh, sooner rather than later is, and maybe it is, and I'm just not plugged in anymore, but one of the things that has to happen is the reclamation of Jewish spiritual practice that brings us to uh, what rabbis talk about, this deeper level of knowing. That, that I think is crucial. So we, I should let you go. It's been an hour and a half <laughs> instead of an hour and you've been gracious enough to sit through the entire thing. But uh, thank you for, for inviting me to do this. We do have a sermon coming up um, whenever that Th thank is. You thank you so much, Rabbi Shapiro. We, we, uh, you were gracious with giving us your, your time more than certainly we had allotted for these conversations. And I will just say for what it's worth that um, my experience at Hebrew Union College and awareness of um, Ziegler and JTS even, um, and certainly Chovave Torah. I can't speak for Yeshiva University or other or other places, but I do believe that 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 inculcation of Jewish spiritual practice has been brought back into oh, uh, much of the curriculum, um, and certainly the Institute for Jewish Spirituality has done incredible work across all denominations in empowering clergy people uh, around Jewish spiritual practices. And um, I, I do believe that that is a change in the mainstream. Um, I don't think you would find a synagogue, for example, in Chicago where there isn't some regular Jewish mindfulness practice offering that isn't really uh, about teaching Zoharic mysticism or a chassidut or musar or wh whatever it might be into the main, bringing it into the main, oh, not as something great. separated. And I think, you know, that's, that's due to your Rebbe by and large, you know, um, in the renewal movement, of course, but I think there, there is a shift in the mainstream uh, as a result of that. And just a general seeker movement where people might not know the words, as you say, for this deeper consciousness, but they yearn for it. Um, and when they find that they can get it in their own tradition, rather than having to seek it out, you know, I wouldn't say at Buddhist meditation centers, I would say they seek it out at soul cycle because they've been told they can right. buy it, um, which is insidious. Um, sorry, that's my judgment. But the, the, you know, we have these incredible wells and stores um, for, for those who might seek it uh, and, and, and it's open access for all here. So I wanna thank you for bringing forward one of the, I think truly more challenging and potentially triggering viewpoints or, or ways of understanding um, grace uh, in this context. Um, but I hope it's one that uh, at a minimum will challenge people and at a maximum might bring some, some comfort. I just will share one final thing as a closing remark. This morning I woke up to, you know, whatever the chaos of the news was in the world and I had this like pit in my stomach that like, oh, there is an impending war. Everything's going to fall apart. What's going to happen? It, it leaves me in an existential state of angst and worry. And I took a deep breath and I, I did a grace meditation at really uh, reminding myself that the world is playing out as it will play out. It is an unfolding and a happening. Uh, and um, we're just, we're a part of it along the way. And there, there is a lot to be grateful for. Uh, there is everything to be grateful for in it. And just that framework um, just that framework in that moment um, can help. It certainly helps me to, to get into a different frame of mind uh, to access something different than I would have otherwise been able to. Um, so just for, just I'll put it out there just for consideration for, for uh, other folks who might uh, be experiencing some of the same feelings. Um, 
thanks everybody for being here. I think Sarah um, included uh, the note about uh, Rabbi Rami Shapira's sermon, which is coming up in December. And uh, we are grateful. I uh, wish everyone a wonderful day. See you later. Shavuot Tov. Shavuot Tov.